they call the seminar Next Generation Road Surveying and Analysis. So I will talk about data collection, analysis, and also a new kind of GIS system. So the topics from today are, first of all, the road serving, how we see it in the future, how it is today, how we see it in the future. Then we zoom in uh, a bit on the next generation LiDAR uh, that is applicable in autonomous vehicles and make the link how this can help in our vision for the future for surveying. Then we zoom in on a next generation uh, geo-information system for pavement management. And then I'll close with a short uh, presentation of the company before we open the questions and answers. For the practical organizations, so many of you already found the question tab in the tool. So at the end, I will go over the questions and try to answer as many as possible. If not, uh, we get a log of all those questions so we can reach out back to you uh, with the answers after that. Okay, so road serving in the future. How do we see that uh, will change? Today, many of the road inspections are done visual. If you look at the number of miles or kilometers over different road networks, then the majority is a smaller network or owned by municipalities, towns, cities, and so on. And those authorities don't have the same budget as the national authorities for road networking. So they do it very often in visual inspection. Visual inspection is very much evolved recently. For instance, we also work together with the Belgian Road Research Center, and they developed a objectivized method to do the visual inspection, meaning that what you do as an inspection, or I would do after training, of course, would give the same final result. But still, it's pretty resource demanding um, for, for those municipalities. And the question that we always uh, get is how can we manage to have more frequent data collection of the road network? How, how can we have more frequently quality checks on the road network? That is important, important for pavement management system. Besides the visual inspection, of course, there are other tools. Besides manual, you have devices like laser devices or APL, as you see on the picture here, analyzer of the profile in a longitudinal way, often used in French speaking countries, uh, as to say. Not that costly, but it only delivers the evenness in the longitudinal way. It's like a representation of the definition of IRI as a two, two wheels and the inertial system. If you go to systems that can provide more than longitudinal evenness, you quickly come to multifunctional vehicles. And multifunctional, field, they, multifunctional field vehicles, they do the job. They measure almost everything. The output, however, is in kind of an Excel format, and it's not easy to interpret if you're not an engineer. And we cannot demand the road authorities or the municipalities all to be engineers either. Uh, and even for engineers, sometimes it's not so easy to interpret why is the rutting bad and what to do about it for sure. So that is where we see a gap in the pavement management system. Besides, you know that multifunctional vehicles, they cost uh, above 1 million euro, which is quite expensive and not within the budget of smaller road authorities. So what's the future? Well, now we make the link to the automotive sector and the autonomous vehicle that everybody hears and reads about in the newspaper and on television. Those future and very soon coming out vehicles are equipped with a massive number of sensors. Cameras, radar and LiDAR are the most commonly used and already integrated in serial cars. Now, if we want to do road measurements, how to make the link, well, those sliders, they will measure and they're there for safety and for assistance of the driver or for autonomous driving. But in the meantime, those sliders, if you focus the development of the LiDAR well, can also measure the surface of the road. So if those vehicles come out, not if, when those vehicles come out, those sliders will measure the road, whether it is for the comfort of the passengers or for safety, 
But that same data can be sent to the cloud because autonomous vehicle come with V2X communication between vehicle and uh, infrastructure and uh, other, other parties through the cloud. Well, that information of the road can be transferred to the cloud and then shared with road authorities. This is our vision of the near future for road serving activities. We talk already today in the community of PMS on digital twin. And what better than a LiDAR? A LiDAR is measuring geometry, will help to build that digital twin. Really 3D digital twin. Camera will be the 2D digital twin. For that digital twin, we are evolving worldwide, Europe, US, uh, Asia, uh, everywhere. What we need to do, and where we are not yet, that is to have more regular and more complete digital twin collection of the road network. So we need to build that inventory, not only the road, but also traffic uh, signs and also vegetation, because that influences the quality or the de degradation of the road infrastructure. We have it in centralized data, and let's work already now to have this fully automated. automated. And the whole purpose of that PMS is to do predictive maintenance and to spend the budget well at the right moment to do the correct repair or refurbishing of the road. Now, there is a way between what we have today and where we will have those lighters, because they're specific lighters, that will be that they are integrated in the level three, level four, level five autonomous vehicles. Now, what we present today is actually a LiDAR that does not need a dedicated vehicle, but a LiDAR that you can put on any vehicle. And the advantage of this concept is that we can put it on utility vehicles. I'm thinking about package deliveries or garbage collection. Imagine you put a LiDAR on a garbage collection car one week and it makes it round or one month, I don't know. And then you put it on another garbage truck, easily to switch. And that other garbage trucks has another route. And so measure the other part of the road network and so on and so on. So we have a flexible system that you can switch from one vehicle to another. You can collect regularly and completely more easily a full road network without dedicated personnel. That is a step in between where we are today and what will come in the near future with more autonomous vehicles. So let's zoom in on a LiDAR. I told you LiDARs together with camera and radar will be part of the sensor suite of autonomous vehicle. This is what I show, but what I see on the screen is actually a LiDAR that is uh, also developed to focus on measuring the road quality. It's actually a LiDAR that is developed for preview for active suspension. So also in the automotive sector. But there we need a very precise digitalization, a digital twin of the road to increase the comfort. The same requirement for serving of road quality. So here you see really in a color code, the full digital twin with numerical values of the road, where you see the joint between one lane and the other is not well done. Green means it's flat. Blue means there's, there's subsidence, so like potholes and cracks. And yellow and red means there's a bump there. So the border of the road also. So this is the kind of data that the LiDAR can provide, and that will help for the autonomous driving of cars, but definitely also brings tremendous value for the road serving in the future. And since you have the full digital twin, you can measure according to any standard from any country or the IRI or any other, the longitudinal evenness, the rutting, you can detect potholes, cracks, and so on. Very shortly, how does this kind of LiDAR work? It's a LiDAR that is uh, available. Well, it's actually a LiDAR that you can put easily on any vehicle, as I mentioned already. You can put it on the roof, in the front or the back. You can put it on the hood. And it sends out actually thousands of lasers simultaneously. 
There's no moving part. It's really LIDAR developed for serious vehicles where uh, automotive prefer no moving parts. But, the, but how do we scan them? It's not only those thousands of points that the LIDAR is emitting, sending light to and then receiving reflected light. The scanning part is actually provided by the car. If the car moves, all those beams scan the road for over the width of one lane. And then you build the full digital twin for kilometers, miles uh, in a row. And so this gives that 3D digital, digital twin as extra information on top of 2D images that were used in road serving. Important for application and keep in mind that lighters are going that in that serial vehicles, uh, solid state, but that's more for the automotive that they want it. High accuracy, this is what you need. These are specifications for the automotive, but that fit the application of road serving. Independent on ambient light, and as I said, it's actually developed in the first place. It was developed for active suspension. Then, of course, looking in front of the vehicle for road serving, it's most often used in the back of the vehicle. And again, the scanning is provided by the traveling of the car. Advantages, I said, uh, LiDAR is, of course, is, is laser, is active illumination. So if it's too crowded during the day, like in the, uh, in the California areas, why not measure it in, during the night? And you can measure it at normal traffic speed, which is also important and advantage compared to, for instance, the APL device that's where the measurements need to be done at a fixed speed. Here, no fixed speeds required, uh, any speed, best results between at 90 km per hour, we do measurements at 120 km and above as well. Just to give you a good flavor, I'll scroll through a kind of live demo that we did for the city of Brussels. So here you see that the digital twin is built up, is constructed while driving. I explained the color code, green, flat, blue, subsidence, yellow and red is more, is higher. And you hear a speed bump to, to lower the speeds of the traffic. Is a speed bump is higher, yellow and red. You see the shape of the cobblestone even. On the right, you see that it's not doing its function. It's more like a subsidence and that you don't see on the picture too much, but you see it on the lighter. And besides the geometry, a lighter also measures the intensity, so you can detect also lane markings or crossings on the road. Just to save some time, I'll speed up and go to the most uh, interesting parts of the detection. You see wherever you are, this is shown in color graph, the digital twin, but it's always values uh, behind it. So you can always measure what is the depth of a, for instance, if you look at a crack here, you see it slightly, you should change the color, color skate. It's all numerical values. I repeat, we represent it in colors, but it's numerical values. And you take a cross and you see here that indeed that crack is a, a, a couple of centimeters deep. And that is again the added value and that definitely the extra that lighter data will bring compared to 2D images. You see some damage on the road, you clearly see it in the lighter data. This is also when it's at night, you don't see it with the camera image, but more important you get when you see a distress on the 2D image, you can measure it and you can quantify. If there's a pothole, you're sure there's a pothole because there's geometry that shows that it's a pothole and not just a wet road or anything. Here we have a bad repair. And again, how bad is it repaired? Well, we take the measurements of the LiDAR data and we see, oh yeah, this is, is this is pretty bad. So it's not only looking bad, but it's also subsidized, it's subsidized. And again, you can uh, detect that information through uh, the intensity that the LiDAR provides. I'm not going too technical, just let me end with some smaller damages where you can wonder, here is this uh, crocodile uh, cracks, um, is there any influence on the road, on the stability of the road? Yes or no? On a picture, you cannot see that. If you look at the LiDAR data, you see there is subsidence. 
Uh, I cannot tell whether first the cracks came and then the asphalt went down and there was subsidence or vice versa, but definitely I see there is damage. So it, it's required to repair, otherwise it will degrade very fast. Okay, besides on-road, for those interested, these kind of measurements can happen also off-road, and there are many applications I will not go in detail. Runway, of course, is a special case of the uh, normal road service measurements with some different criteria, and uh, the shape of a runway for uh, landing and taking off uh, should be uh, different, so the water will flow off. It should be very flat, uh, quite some stringent IRI or evenness uh, requirements in the longitudinal way. Um, but this is a standard now, just to say where LiDAR can be used is wherever you do easy or more complex road serving projects today. Even in when you're building the road, and for road construction companies, we have uh, a, a few road construction, very innovative uh, companies that are working on this to, to decide whether the work they're doing on the spot is compliant with the regulations of the or the requirements of the road authority or the government. And here you see some online measurements of the undulation of road, which is representative for the evenness or the IRI. And so that can be measured while you're doing asphalt or concrete roads. What does the system um, look like? We talk about six dimensional road scanning. I showed you the 3D from the LiDAR. This is a special LiDAR. I repeat, uh, developed also for integration in serial cars. Beside the 3D geometry, the LiDAR gives you the intensity. That's the fourth dimension. And then an extra high definition 12 megapixel camera to have the full six dimension. The camera helps for some of the, of the defects to identify. And then you can qualify uh, with the LiDAR. And also because most people are used to look at 2D images and it always helps to see where it is so you can immediately send a service team on the spot. I will come back to, the, to this point uh, later on. So to summarize, it's uh, LiDAR for road serving that can be used also for many other, by many other uh, uh, users in other uh, applications. It's used in, in Japan already extensively. Uh, in the US, we're building it up and we do ourselves services in uh, Europe. Now, besides collecting data and analyzing, you also need to visualize the results in an easy way to communicate between road construction companies and road authorities and government and municipalities and so on. So there's a lot of effort done to improve the pavement management system and also predict what to be done to have a good quality within a certain community budget. Uh, but for the communication, visualization of data is of extreme importance. I explain it on one use case. So this is a use case where we had a concrete layered road with three lanes. And some of the parts of the road were repaired. And complaints came in into the town office, in the city uh, office, to the mayor that the road quality was worse, that the sound for the neighboring houses was worse. And why did we spend this taxpayer money to have a situation that is worse than before? When you look at the pictures, there's nothing wrong to see. So the repaired sections to me, except for the connections here, but look okay. If we look at the IRI, however, we see that the level of comfort is not sufficient at all. It's like uh, looking at a, at a badly maintained off-road road at many positions. And zooming into detail, we identified that many of those positions were the newly paved road parts. Not exactly what was their purpose, uh, spending the, that money. So I repeat, when you look at the 2D images, it's not easy to see that anything is wrong. I see the IRI is, 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 let's say, wrong. It's way too high. But why and what? 
And that's where, that is where the LiDAR data pops in. Here again, I show you, as I showed you during the uh, kind of virtual live demo, the color representation of the 3D digital twin of that part of the road. What we clearly here see, remember the color code, huh? green is flat, blue is lower, so subsidence, and yellow red is higher. What we see here on one spot in one look, and you don't need to be engineer for that, that we have grooves in the road. And that we don't have them in the parts before the not renewed part of the concrete slabs. Now grooves, you know that grooves are produced during the concrete layering, either because it's done manually, or the slip former or extruder is going at not a constant pace, or the concrete was too dry. So this is also useful information for construction companies. So they understand what to do. And of course, they would like to see that on the spot because redoing is milling and, and refurbishing uh, with concrete, that's pretty expensive. You can look and see what's happening on the spot while you are performing refurbishing, that will be very helpful. In this uh, project, uh, the customer was a municipality, so the road construction company was not so happy. In other projects, uh, uh, we provide data where the road construction was, uh, company was happy uh, and uh, got proof to make their point to the customer. Now, this is data that all together should be visualized in an easy way, as I said, to make the communication between road construction companies and road authorities more easily. While I was doing that intro, I log on live. This is real life in a next generation GIS system, as I provided, where we have lots of data. Let me take a project that we use internally so I can share some data. And let me then pick the right road. I'm on the right road. Um, I'll first um, tell you what we see on, on this data. So let me go to the right position. I've made a note of that and then I'll explain. What we see on the left upper corner is the digital map. And on that digital map of your road network, you can put whatever index that you calculate. It might be the coefficient of planetarity two and a half meter. This is according to the Belgian standards. We have three standards on evenness, two and a half meter waves, 10 meter waves, and 40 meter waves. So you can choose that. You can choose the rutting to show that. I will not show the rutting on this uh, example. And you see with color codes again, and the meaning of the color codes are here. What is the value? And the higher the value, the, the, the worse. So not good. Higher value is not, not good. And you see if you want it pretty flat, should be blue or green. And when it's red, something is, is missing. On the lower left corner, you see the traditional 2D image. In the middle, you see the 3D digital twin in a special color code here. The intensity, that's indicating the road markings. The longitudinal profile and some of the values that you calculated. And again, this you can choose in your setting what you want to see on, on your map. So for this, I wanted to have the rutting index calculated and the longitudinal steepness two and a half. I chose for only two for this example. So I have in one overview all that data. I don't need to scroll. If I ask for more data, then I need to scroll up and down with this bar. Okay, and on the right, you have the underlying table data that is actually the numerical values of what you see on your screen. Just to say how easy you have in one overlook, what is the quality of the data? And I, I chose this because this is a very clear example that in this case, you have rotting. And if you say, yeah, do I have rotting? I measure rotting. But here visually, if I look only at the digital twin, the LiDAR data, I see I have subsidence on the path of the wheels here. So if I want to investigate this further, I can go over the road 
every 100 meter or every 10 meter. I can also pin with my pin and look at a certain section. I can take my hand and uh, scroll over it to see where that rotting might end and what is the uh, connection with the uh, evenness. Where is my rotting now? Here, this is a rotting. Uh, I'll put the longitudinal evenness 10 uh, out so I have everything on one view. Um, I can put my pin at any position and detect. Now let me jump to that section where um, I did a study. So suppose you wander over all this data to investigate and I'll go to week 20 where the thing is happening. What we see here clearly again on the digital twin that we have rutting on the asphalt part and that the rutting stopped on the concrete part. That is for your no surprise because the concrete uh, does not uh, give rutting. But it gives you a jump from rutting high values of rutting to lower values of rutting. And to, to do the interpretation, it's much easier to look at it on the uh, digital twin. Let me scroll a little further to see if we have other. Here you see some uh, repair that you clearly see here on the digital twin as well and that influences the rotting value but here you see why this you can imagine you could have found with just a 2d picture but here you see that's really it's not just visual there is some geometrical influence there let me go further if i find something else to share some repairs again here influence on on the rotting uh, so this makes it easier easier to interpret and to communicate. We had um, projects where the rotting value uh, with a multifunctional vehicle was evaluated as being bad. And there was this discussion between the, the road owner, the authority, and the road construction company. In the end, it came out, it came out that uh, the rotting was taking the curbstone as part of the road. And of course, if you think the curbstone is part of the road where you need to drive, then you have quite some uh, big uh, subsidence, some gap in, in, the, in the altitude. Uh, this you would see immediately on the digital twin of that uh, road. So the advantages of digital data in the process for evaluation and communication. So to start wrapping up, or the evolution of more regular and more complete road surveying. We need fast and efficient methods and devices. The digital twin gives extra information on visual representation, on interpretation and communications. I explained what are the six dimensions and I introduced the new system uh, Synchronized, of course, with GPS data, so you know where it is. There was also a link to the hectometer. I forgot to explain that. Uh, where you combine all this data in an easy way to scroll through and to communicate what might be wrong or what should be repaired. Besides the raw data, going to characteristics, as I showed, and to do trend analysis, um, the New GIS system also provide the opportunity to compare data from year 2017 with year 2021, for instance, and to see how is the uh, analysis to visualize also the degradation and then check that with the theoretical models you have in your PMS system to see whether it follows that uh, model and when you need to do a repair. This is in a pretty fast uh, way, uh, our view on the future of road surveying and communication with the purpose to help uh, municipalities and not only the national uh, road owners, but also the national road owners to help them for communication and uh, analysis to really start using that PMS as what it is meant for really manage the road repairs, refurbishing, uh, reconstruction, uh, fitting the budget with valuable objective data. As we do, we are a LIDAR company. 
uh, focusing on hardware and software to bring this solution to the market. We also have a team that uh, does projects for road surveying in uh, Europe around our headquarters. Headquarters is in Belgium, but also uh, some projects we do in the US and in China, where we have offices. And even with our distributors that we've trained to use this system uh, for road serving, as in Japan with Toyo Corporation. Um, and they have customers that use it uh, as well. As you see, as presentation of the company that we focused in the beginning, a lot of automotive. That is why we can make that link and have that vision on how road serving in the future will look like. And now, uh, going and expanding more and more in the road markets. We are a innovative company started, company started in 2013 uh, and are evolving in different markets with this special new LiDAR technology. The takeaways for you for this presentation before we go to the Q&A session is that the technology for autonomous vehicle is getting there. So many promises were made that it would be ready by 2018, 2021, the full autonomous vehicle would uh, be available. Now all those CEOs from big companies, they don't talk about it anymore because it is delayed. And that's not due to COVID, it is delayed, but it will come there. Let me reassure you, it, it will come there. And let's take this opportunity um, with all those sensors on that vehicle to use that free information, I would say, for the further developments and more on regular uh, auscultation and analysis of the condition of the road. And the digital twin uh, provided the 3D geometry and the intensity for road markings is an important factor in that uh, development. I explained the six dimensions, I introduced a new communication system, I can call it, geo GIS uh, system. And as a company, we focus on hardware and software, and we do services to promote the solution with this new uh, automotive technology. This brings me to the end of this uh, webinar. I think uh, I'm, I'm well in time. Uh, the Q&A session is definitely uh, as important. So I will pop up the questions. Uh, many people answered that indeed they could hear me. Thank you, because I was not uh, sure you could in the beginning. So then um, I go, give me some time to go over the uh, questions and see how I can efficiently answer to you. Uh, some people cannot hear me, so I might have lost uh, people because of that. Others could hear me. One question, what information do you collect about the road line markings and road center lane markings? So the data from the LiDAR uh, that uh, is used to detect the road markings, whether it's lane marking or whether it's a, a stop, painted on the road or whether it's a crossing and that can be with paint or with other with, with high reflective stones just whatever we see with our eyes more visual it's drawing the attention uh, that is detected because that is reflecting more light so the lighter will uh, disclose that in the information on uh, intensity so i explained the 3d information and the intensity together the 4d information from the lighter Another question uh, pops up, whether we have services for airport runway scanning. Uh, yes, we do. We did uh, projects on uh, runway for uh, airports. Uh, actually, not for the airport itself that we did it, but for a supplier for that airport. And as I explained, um, it was very well and interesting for the airport owner to see that the shape of the runway indeed is, uh, is uh, as required. So the water will uh, drop out to the sides of it. So besides even as numbers uh, that you might have from a multifunctional vehicle and tells you it's good or it's bad, 
uh, again here you scroll through that digital twin and you see why it is good or why is it bad other question is the concern on the position of the car so uh, we do indeed i did not go in detail on that but we do indeed beside the lighter and the camera we uh, synchronize also a gns receiver so we know uh, where we are we have two options we have the option with a not so precise gns which is for road serving uh, often uh, enough uh, and we have options with an rtk uh, gns receiver that is coupled to the system so both can be used if you're going for projects uh, where you want to um, uh, use that data for uh, absolute values of the road so in the road coordinate system then of course you need that rtk uh, gns receiver and then there are other models, methods to even uh, tune it uh, to millimeter precision uh, if you want to without that we are in the, the, the standard we reach uh, precision in the global world coordinate system in the height of six millimeter uh, if you have done other points that you marked and that we can detect then uh, with other software you can improve even that performance uh, there's one question on the cost of a system uh, the cost of the system the basic system uh, uh, it's it is between uh, 100,000 and 150,000 uh, euro um, this is compared to other competitive system on the lower side. If you compare it to a multifunctional vehicle, it's definitely on the lower side. I'm not saying it's not an investment. It is investment equipment. I go to the next question. How many points did you scan per meter square? That's actually a, a difficult one. Uh, why? Because uh, the LiDAR, where it takes one shot, it uh, measures uh, a couple of thousand points, so 3,000, 4,000 points in one shot. We do repeat the measurements at 60 hertz, up to 60 hertz, meaning we have 60 times those thousands of points per second. And so if we are standing still or driving slowly per square meter, we have, we have tons of data. Uh, it is because we have so many lasers that we measure simultaneously in global shutter, as we call it, and we have a high frame rate that we obtain the, and with all that data, we obtain the high accurate digital twin, which is a combination of all that data combined with a, a special algorithm. So the, the number of data, it's, uh, let's say the 3,000 uh, 3, or more points per shot, per global shutter, times uh, 60 hertz. What is the achievable absolute and relative accuracy of the point cloud? The relative accuracy, uh, it's, it's actually a very good point uh, to make the distinguishing, distinguish, uh, distinction between absolute and relative uh, accuracy. The relative accuracy is very important for applications like preview for active suspension, because then the car only uh, uh, is, is uh, considering what is happening in front of the car. It's not interested in the absolute coordinates at all. So there we receive that relative precision of accuracy of millimeter. It is uh, related to speed, but not linear, meaning that up to those 90 kilometers per hour to three millimeter accuracy. Uh, in, in at higher speeds, uh, we easily get that accuracy uh, below the five millimeter, well below the five millimeter. If we go to absolute accuracy, uh, that we have um, algorithms that uh, reduce drastically the drift, as, as you probably know, that is always happening when you do measurements and combine them over a longer distance. Uh, that is uh, reduced by the algorithm, but to have those absolute values in millimeter precision, again, you do need that link to uh, RTK GNS. And then you can, as I said, in absolute value, uh, obtain those five, six millimeter precision. If you want to even improve that for some applications, and sometimes it's required for production or for simulation, um, then there's other means uh, by marking the road uh, and for those old points you do have the very accurate absolute uh, coordinates 
and then you can uh, correct the whole data, the whole digital twin of the road based on those points. We do projects uh, on that as well. Depending on how accurate your basic data is, how many points per uh, kilometer or mile you need to measure to obtain the absolute values. What is challenging in managing these data sets? That's actually a, a very a practical question, uh, also very important. I showed you the GIS system where we do downsize the, uh, the, the, data, uh, the data storage space required and still make it fully interpretable. So all data is there. Um, the, the method is of course that we measure the 2D images. 2D images take, take space. Huh? So the, the, the method is that you take a 2D image every five meter as an example, and that you fit and you have the LiDAR data for the same five meters. So you combine uh, those data for the interpretation. Um, so some, some say that they don't need then the 2D image or they can take it every 10 meter. That will uh, reduce. If you store the data in the cloud, um, it's like for a 100, uh, 100 kilometer of data, I think uh, you need like uh, 100 gigabytes for the full data set. Uh, roughly, that's a rule of thumb. Okay, uh, other question. Um, yeah, so if, if you're interested in more confidential information, um, I cannot uh, share that, um, but we, we can, of course, uh, discuss offline. If you have a project uh, where you um, are interested in it, and then we can use our expertise, but we cannot disclose the projects that we did for companies who asked for an NDA. But that I would ask you to reach out to us uh, offline. Okay, um, Okay. So, some more questions uh, pop in, we have more time, okay. So for obtaining five millimeter accuracy, how much the length of one segment in one mission? If um, I'm, I'm reading the question uh, and, and trying to formulate the correct answer. So it's, so it's more a question here that is on the repeatability of the measurements. Repeatability um, that you want to compare the 3D geometry uh, over time can be based on world coordinates because then you have one coordinate system that you can refer to. Um, if the whole road has lowered, then you see that difference. It depends on whether you're interested in that. Um, repeatability in the question is also asking for if you have a one segment in one mission, um, what is the length of the road? Uh, that would affect the whole data set. I'm not sure I, I understand the question completely. Um, what I think it might refer to that if you're uh, building that digital twin over time, uh, as I called it, uh, drift will occur uh, even with our algorithm over time. So if you made a loop of let's say five kilometers, uh, then you should not expect that when you return at the starting point, that the road will be at millimeter the same uh, precise uh, altitude level if you've not done uh, corrections uh, uh, as to say if you did then you can uh, envision that if you don't there will be drift a drift uh, is worked on very heavily to reduce it so meaning that if you measure it uh, and you have if you measure it and you come back to the same spot that you are very close and if you do correction with an RTK even closer and if you do then uh, uh, correction further with uh, total stations on some points the data from total stations 
then you can uh, have a very, very accurate in absolute value, in absolute road coordinates. So also repeatability. So the repeatability is actually linked to the world corners. So the, there I would suggest you go definitely for GNS, not decay GNS. Can the device, another question, can the device circulate without restriction or need for assistance uh, and uh, spacing? Uh, at this moment, not. Uh, so this moment, it's a measurement device like all other devices. The big difference is that it gives that digital twin. And the big difference is that you can put device on any kind of vehicle. So you don't need dedicated vehicle and it's calibrated for that. But you need it running with software on, on a kind of a PC controller. So uh, it needs start and stop. Well, we have one uh, software possibility to do automatic start and stop, but you need to start up uh, the system and then to close down. Uh, so there is some manipulation assistance required today. Uh, this will further evolve. If it's integrated in level three, level four autonomous cars, then all that data will be collected automatically. That's required for the functional, the safety and the application within that vehicle passenger car. And then that data can be transmitted to cloud automatically. And that is all under development in the automotive sector. So that's the, that's the advice. Let's use that. And, and then it will be without assistance. Today it is with assistance. For measurement or scanning the roads, do you need a base station? No, you don't. Uh, so I refer to, that's more referring to the question of the um, relative coordinate system and the worldwide uh, coordinate system. Um, if you are interested in the road condition over 100 kilometers with the RTK GNS, uh, uh, then you have very accurate information and very accurate enough for IRI or evenness. If you're really looking for uh, to measure a road that is with uh, a perfect condition, so a very low IRI, then with the RTK, you still get the correct information. Um, so if you go for other application where the five, six millimeter absolute coordinate is not sufficient, then you need to go to uh, points measured uh, by uh, total station. Next question, how much room do you need between your own car and a possible car ahead of you? Uh, that's, uh, 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 again, a good question. Uh, and it follows with another question. Could cars ahead of you obstruct the scan area? Um, it can, but it depends on where you put it on a car. So if we use this slider for applications in preview for active suspension, then of course the slider should look ahead of the car. And so it can give that information to the suspension to increase the comfort. That is proven uh, research and development. Uh, if we talk about road serving as the focus, then we mainly put it in the back of the car. And one of the reasons is that indeed, if you put it at a higher position on the roof, but in the back of a car of a van or a, uh, a SUV, then you can uh, shine, then you can orient direct the lighter more downwards and measure very close to the car where no other car will obstruct the data. So that's one of the advantage or one of the reasons why uh, we advise to put for road driving the LiDAR in the back and uh, to use a vehicle that is like a van or an SUV. It can be on a Berlin as well, if you can position it then on the, on the trunk. Uh, and again, the same for if you put it in the front, you can put it on the on the hood of the car with the consequences that the, the, the witness, the, the width of the measurements is a bit lower. So it will be just one lane instead of extending a lane and that you measure a little less far if you put it lower to the ground. As you can imagine that the light is shining not so far ahead, but still uh, lots of development is done with the light on the hood. In the end, it will be in serial cars, not always on the roof or behind the windshield, but might be in the headlights or the rear lights from the car. So uh, that, that can, can work as well. 
So that's about the uh, avoiding obstruction. If we, we have obstructions, and you will see on some of the videos that we want to avoid, so we have a following car, but it's not required. Uh, most of the data, uh, the algorithm can check when there, there's obstruction uh, and then filter it out. Now, if you have a car that is uh, in your tail all the time at one, two meter uh, uh, behind you, then of course you will not be able to measure. The same if you measure in front and your uh, your uh, tailing in, 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 in the person or the, the car in front of you, then the LiDAR cannot see it. Whatever the LiDAR cannot see, then it cannot measure it. So you need indeed enough space uh, to measure. I refer to the possibility to also measure when it's very crowded uh, at night without a following car. Most of the some measurements we do for following car, uh, very often we don't use. Okay, thank you for all these uh, very interesting uh, questions. Um, it, it, it shows to me that uh, we were able today to pass a, a certain message and that you are very familiar with the, the topic of road serving and devices. So I urge you please uh, contact us for more questions or for more information for a uh, virtual demonstration or very soon a physical uh, demo at our site. If you want to do uh, a small project as a proof of concept, we can come to your site. We don't go everywhere in the world uh, today because we need that first line support locally from our own office or a uh, partner, a technical partner, so that the, the users of the system are well informed and get up to speeds in using it uh, very fast. That's the purpose. Okay, um, I think uh, here we can close uh, this session. It took three quarters of an hour, a little over. Uh, that's fine. If you have more questions, uh, please uh, reach out. I'll show you my uh, coordinates. You can also reach our marketing specialist, Ivana, at uh, but if you send it that info at xenomatics.com, uh, one of us will pick it up for sure. So I leave this up the screen for a couple of minutes. Uh, you find this on, on our website, of course, as well, on Twitter, LinkedIn, and you find some uh, videos of live measurements on our YouTube channel that you can all reach to our website. One, once more, thanks for uh, joining us today. And let us hear if you have more questions and we'll come back to you very soon. Thank you and have a nice day. Take care. Bye.